You are watching Chippewa Valley Community Television. The audio for this program can be heard on WRFPLP 101.9 FM. Thank you very much for coming to this special forum and panel discussion entitled Dangers Unseen, Blasting Ultrafine Particles and Human Health. What a relevant topic for all of us. Tonight we are privileged to have two people on our panel from West Virginia but we also have visitors from Iowa, Minnesota, Massachusetts, and of course, many of you from Wisconsin. This will ha is how it, it will work. Uh, Dr. Mike McCauley will speak for 30 minutes. Crispin Pierce and his student, Kirsten Walters, will speak for 30 minutes, followed by about 50 minutes of questions and answers. To avoid the reading of lengthy background material, we have provided a bio sheet, which can be picked up at the table if you haven't done that, and don't all go there now, but if, we, if you need them, we'll be happy to get them to you for each one of the speakers. You may write questions on the cards that you've been provided, and if you've forgotten to pick up a card, uh, we'll get those to you as well. They will be picked up with the questions on them as the evening progresses for use during the question and answer period. A very special thank you goes out to everyone who contributed in the many ways to the organizing of this event, including many of you. The Pinocchio Hills Education Project is credited for bringing Dr. McCauley and Bob Kincaid from West Virginia to Eau Claire tonight. And by the way, they will be in Ashland uh, tomorrow night, right? Bob Kincaid, <coughs> Kincaid will be your moderator. He is a nationally known broadcaster whose network has devoted more time than any other broadcast medium to educating people about the imperative to end mountaintop removal. I'm just going to say this briefly before I have him come up here, that there are the uh, materials on the back table back there about the Pinocchio Hills project, and we hope that you will pick those things up. There are also some containers for donations if you'd like to get them. At this time, I'd like to introduce you to Bob Kincaid, who will guide you through the program. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pat. My name is Bob Kincaid. I come from West Virginia. I'm the president of the board of Coal River Mountain Watch, a grassroots organization that has been working for many years now to end the ongoing human rights, human health uh, nightmare I call it an apocalypse, of mountaintop removal coal extraction. It was in that regard that I first met Pete Rasmussen uh, of the Pinocchio Hills Education Project when I came up here a couple of, couple of years back and immediately recognized the common bond that we all share. Because whether it be coal or taconite iron ore in the Pinocchios or silica frac sand out this way, there is a common element that binds them all. And that is the use of heavy industrial blasting and the impacts that it has on the air we breathe and on our very lives themselves. And I just wanted to offer that by way of um, prefatory introduction because the way I see it, any individual group struggling against one of these industries in, 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 a, in a fight to preserve its very existence is in an uphill battle. And until such time as we all link arms and all, rec all recognize that our struggle is your struggle, is their struggle, and that it is in fact in common all our struggle, we're going to have a problem. But when we do link up and we do realize that we have a common struggle, then we can begin to turn the tide. Now, the, uh, the thing that changed, what changed everything for us is we had been struggling against mountaintop removal for years. We had protested, we had marched, we demonstrated, we'd been arrested in civil disobedience. 
And then a body of scientific research began emerging of which Dr. McCauley is a significant part, and you'll hear about that later. And that's why I started saying, you know, there's a lot of blasting happening here. I think we need to talk about it in those terms as well. And I was very, very pleased when I found out that lo and behold, you've got someone here on campus who is doing the same sort of work. And so we will start this evening uh, hearing from Dr. Crispin Pierce. He is with, uh, he's the Associate Pref Professor and Director of the Environmental Public Health Program here at the university. He has done the kind of work that has to be done in order to prove that communities and the integrity of human communities are more important than the relentless, merciless, and remorseless search for more money. And so we're going to hear from him first in regard to his work on particulate matter. And we will then hear from his graduate student, Kristen, and then we will hear from Dr. McCauley. So I ask you all for your kind attention for Dr. Crispin Pierce. Would you want me to uh, amp all this? Yeah, I think I will, yeah. Great. Good evening. Uh, I really appreciate the people who are here. Your interest in this very, very important issue. I do speak tonight as a scientist and a faculty member here, uh, and we want to share the data that we're starting to collect and encourage others to collect the same kind of information because we believe there is some degree of concern for people who are living around sand mines. We're concerned about small particulate matter as well as crystalline silica, and our initial data suggests that we need more monitoring to make sure that we are protecting people in our communities. I'd like to start with the most important people in the room, uh, the people who put this whole beautiful facility together, that is our students. In particular, Jaron Jacobson is the president of our student organization called the Student National Environmental Health Association. Jaron is a leader amongst students in our courses, in our graduate, in our program, and um, Jaron, I'd like to just welcome you to come on up and talk a little bit about the importance that students play in the role that we do with faculty student research. Hello everyone, my name is Jaron Jacobson and I am the president of the 2013-2014 calendar school year uh, UW-Eau Claire chapter, Student Environmental Health Association. And in conjunction with the environmental public health major, we work to strive for our mission statement, which I'll read right now. The focus of the Student National Environmental Health Association is to improve the lives and well-being of the public by focusing on environmental health quality, organizational activities, which include community outreach projects, environmental health presentations, highway cleanup and waste reduction efforts, Earth Month, including Earth Day, environmental health awareness programs, and professional development. In addition, we are also very um, keen to participate in student research like you are about to see. So I would like to say thank you very much for seeing us and what we have to say. Thank you, Jaron. And if I could have Kristen Walters come to the front. Kristen is one of those students who has been out in the snow and the 20 degree wind chill factor outside in many places throughout, throughout Wisconsin. So Kristen, welcome. She's going to help me with the presentation. We also should have a, a one page front to back uh, presentation handout. If people didn't get them, we'll make sure you get them. So, and we have a sign up sheet in the back if you weren't able to get one. So again, the number one uh, part of acknowledgement is the students who've been out in the cold, been out in the sunshine, been out next to railroad tracks. These are the young people who are making a difference, and I'm very, very proud of the work they're doing. We have new academic partners, including University of Wisconsin Stout, and we had a student from uh, Stout this afternoon. We're sharing equipment and expertise as well as partners at the University of Iowa in the Environmental Health Sciences Research Center. Uh, we co-wrote a grant and were funded, so we now have more money to buy better equipment to uh, support students like Kristen uh, and expertise. So we are very, very happy to have these academic partners. So looking at the health risks that are of concern as environmental health professionals, we're looking at airborne pollutants, which is the focus of our work, Certainly waterborne pollutants, and many of you have heard about polyacrylamide and acrylamide. Noise pollution, light pollution, 
wetland loss that affects local water quality, truck traffic that affects air quality and road safety, as well as greenhouse gas generation. We focused on airborne pollutants. Particulate matter is of particular concern because it's associated with respiratory symptoms, cough, irritation of the airways, exacerbation of asthma, development of chronic bronchitis, even a regular heartbeat for the smallest particles, non-fatal heart attacks, and premature death in people with heart or lung disease. Particle size is very important. Uh, the upper arrows point to the sizes that frac sand companies want. So these particles are taken and mixed with a slurry with water and other chemicals and injected thousands of meters down and then horizontally in fracturing sites to fracture the, sh the shale to remove the oil and the gas. The particles we're most concerned about, though, you can barely, barely see here on the right side of your screen, the little dot, the clays. Those are the particles, the PM2.5, that get into the deep lungs and are most associated with health effects. And as a matter of fact, uh, we have a little demonstration for you. So Kristen's going to come around, and we have a little package of hot chocolate. And so Kristen, why don't you go ahead and walk that through the audience. So as you smell the hot chocolate, I am a professor, so we are going to do some hands-on experiments in the, the lecture today. So let me know, raise your hand if you smell the hot chocolate, if you're smelling any of that. Good. Yep. Good. And the point being that we can be exposed to substances like hot chocolate without actually seeing big puffs, big um, amounts. So being able to see what's going on is not necessarily a good indicator. So Jaron, could you come up here again, please? We also have one of our instruments. This is called the dust track. We take this into the field. It measures small particles. And, Jaron, if you could just begin to read off the numbers that we start to see sure. in this. Absolutely. So we have here a PM 2.5 filter. So we're looking at what's being generated in the air right now. What are some of the levels we have now, Jaron? Right now it's reading 0 0.028 milligrams per cubic meter. Here we have some local uh, natural sandstone from which frac sand is derived. And uh, what I'd like to do is show you that just with a little bit of movement and putting the inlet up towards the, the monitor and towards the sand, we'll see a large increase. What are we talking about now? Now we're seeing on the order of 0.178 milligrams per cubic meter. So about 15 times higher levels. No big puff of smoke, no big event. That's why the measurement of these small particles is so, so important. Again, we're talking about the PM 2.5, the particles that are most dangerous to our health. So measurement is essential. Thank you, John. Crystalline silica is one of these small components, and it's a particular danger because of its physical and chemical characteristics. Um, oftentimes, there'll be a comparison between sand and cr respirable crystalline silica. And you can see here in the picture, sand is much larger particles, things that we might spread on the road or might be part of a, uh, a playground. The ones we're most concerned about are the respirable quantities, which means on the order of the PM 2.5. The, the, the small particles get into our deep lung. Uh, silicosis is... Um, a result of a chronic exposure to silica. It's a fibrous or scarring of the lungs. It's progressive. There's no cure. It leads to disability and death. Also associated with kidney and autoimmune diseases. Uh, NIOSH estimates that we'll lose about 200 people uh, this year uh, from silicosis in occupational settings. And Wisconsin's share of that is between 8 and 18 people are expected to die from silicosis from workplace exposure. Uh, silica is also classified as a carcinogen, a lung carcinogen, by the following agencies, uh, International Agency for Research on Cancer, uh, ACGIH, OSHA, NIOSH, occupational and environmental organizations that study human health. So how are these small particulates in silica generated during sand operations? So frac sand mining and processing generate particulate matter in silica through blasting, loading and hauling. Uh, I know folks up in the Bridge Creek area have been providing um, photos of the blasting activity up there. It's clear that we're having a lot of generation of particulate matter. Crushing and transporting frac sand and waste sand. Again, just uh, to reiterate, it's the small waste sand that's the smallest particles. It's not the particles that frac sand companies want to use for fracturing. It actually is what they want to return for the reclamation that we're most concerned about because of its very, very small size. 
And here is a photograph in western Wisconsin. It's perhaps a little difficult to see, but from these frac sand particles, we can have substantial levels of small particles being lifted into the air on windy days. Uh, Kristen, can you kind of talk about some of the other characteristics that, that dictate the kind of concentrations we've been measuring in the air around frac sand plants? Well, we've been looking at the humidity in the air and the wind speed, wind direction. On very, very um, snowy days, we've seen a few. On rainy days, we've seen a few of those too. Actually, dust levels are suppressed. So the, the factors that seem to determine the particulate levels we're measuring are the degree of plant activity, full operation, we have higher levels, and then wind can tend to lower the levels, so can precipitation. Both rain and snow can lower the levels that we're measuring. As we look at regulation, six states, now recently Minnesota adopted a standard of three microgram per cubic meter for respirable or PM4 crystalline silica, as well as five other states around the country, many of them following the very, very careful job that the state of California has done. Uh, I believe also that value is, is quite appropriate of three microgram per cubic meter. How does DNR regulate sand plants? Well, they use a computer model called AirMod, and it's an air dispersion modeling program. And so a, a frac sand proponent will say, we want to process 100 tons a day, and we're going to be using a dryer, and we're going to be using an elevator, we're going to be using this processor. So DNR takes those numbers and puts them into a computer model to predict the concentration of particulates in that area. Oftentimes, well, the PM10 monitoring, now PM10 are going to be the larger particles. In the law, DNR has the ability to require monitoring. When they do monitor, they ask for the PM10 monitors. And it's, it's a much more uh, lax standard, if you will, standard of 150 compared to the PM2.5, which is 12. So, and oftentimes DNR will agree to a sand mining company's request to waive that requirement. They will say, we're going to do a good job of controlling our dust, and DNR will say, okay, you don't need to monitor. However, as a scientist, uh, I want more information, not less information. Fugitive dust control plans are also part of these applications. Uh, companies will say, we're going to water down the roads, we're going to reduce truck traffic and truck idling. And certainly those are ways in which uh, we can reduce the concentrations, but without monitoring, we don't know that they're effective. Uh, our critique is the DNR approach. It doesn't generally include fugitive dust emissions in prediction of pollutant levels. It doesn't consider cumulative effects from nearby sources. So I know folks who live in New Auburn, we have four or five facilities very, very close in that area. DNR doesn't consider existing facilities when they, they decide whether or not to permit a new facility. They've declined, as many of the people in this room were part of a petition to regulate crystalline silica. And we've talked about it's a human carcinogen. Uh, DNR agrees that it is, but believes we don't have enough information about exposure or how to measure it. So it's chosen. DNR has said that they will not regulate it at this time. And does not, the DNR does not require monitoring of PM2.5, the par size particles we're most concerned about, or silica. Some examples, just visual examples of places where the DNR has been called out and seen some violations. This is truck to train transfer down in the Patterson sand mine area. As you can see, the particulates emanating from this transfer process. And industry studies. I, I do believe that all the scientists who are involved in this can contribute, we can learn more. This is by a gentleman named Dr. John Richards. He published this, actually he hasn't published this yet, but he submitted to DNR. And he found very low levels of crystalline silica, below about one microgram per cubic meter. And if this holds true, it's certainly good news. Um, however, it doesn't jibe with the work that we have done so far. So I'm certainly hoping that Dr. Richards will submit this for publication, as we did actually yesterday. When we look at other industry values, um, up at the, um, let's see, this is the Superior Silica Sand Mine up in New Auburn. They provided industry values of 10 to 30 microgram per cubic meter PM10. If we take our values, we go out and measure PM10 and PM2.5, when we make that adjustment, we come to levels of 6 to 19. The standard is 12. So again, it, it calls out for more research. We're finding levels that can be of concern to people who live in this area. The Wisconsin Occupational Health Lab study has done some work with the New Auburn School, 
and uh, our analysis of the data that there was an increase from less than 1% in June to December 2011 to 5-10% to crystalline silica in the next period in the new Auburn school air filters. So our research, again, students in the cold, 20 below, sacrificing their weekends. So I, I just, I'm very, very proud of the work our students have done. We have looked at, now I've been actually out 15 times to local sand mining, processing, and transport sites. Um, we've been out to Winona, Minnesota, because there are some considerations, some proposals to put in facilities there. And we've collected PM 2.5 and PM 10 sites, particulate concentrations in and around active and inactive sites. Uh, one of the criticisms from DNR, and it's a valid criticism, is we're taking little one-minute snapshots with this instrument and three others now. And ultimately, because silicosis and lung cancer is a long-term disease, we want to take long-term concentrations. That's why I'm so excited about our partnership with the University of Iowa. They will be providing with us, loaning us in January, um, an EPA-certified FRM, Federal Reference Method Dichotomous Sampler. Dichotomous just means you can measure two different sizes at once, as well as silica. So really exciting to be partner partnering with University of Iowa, because their machine will also be part of the work we're doing. In addition, um, I began asking in January, still haven't heard yet back from the DNR, we want to put all our instruments next to their instruments in Eau Claire to see if we have any bias. Because as a scientist, we really want to know what people are breathing, not necessarily what instrument is saying, but getting good, good uh, correlation. So we're hoping to hear back from the DNR to co-locate our instruments so that we can look for any potential bias. In addition to these one to two minute snapshots, and we'll take um, 20 or 30 or 40 samples. So we're out there for about two hours collecting data. We record longitude, latitude, relative humidity, wind speed and direction, time, and also the degree of activity at the sand plant. We believe that 2.5 may be the best indicator of public health risk. We have decades of research. I know we're going to hear a little bit about this and maybe some, uh, some disagreement about this later in the presentation, which I welcome. But EPA has found that this is a valuable way to protect public health from decades of research that show that 4 to 14 percent increased risk of death from all natural causes, 6 to 26 percent increase of risk from cardiopulmonary or cardiovascular diseases, and 8 to 37 percent increased risk of death from lung cancer. So this is not just from frac sand plants. This is data that we've had from dirty cities. If we look at pictures of Beijing and see, we can see the air. These people are at very, very high risk of cardiovascular disease and cancer and lung problems. So it's not a new problem. It's something we've studied for decades and decades. We believe that measurement enforcement of the current EPA 12 microgram per cubic meter standard is likely to protect also against silica risk. So we know that it's the small particles we're concerned about. We know that amongst those small particles, the silica is the most dangerous component. However, when MSHA, the Mine Safety and Health Administration, evaluated 41 mine sites in Wisconsin, they found that about 15% of the small particles are silica. So if you do the math, you say the, the standard for PM 2.5 is 12. We think about 15% of that is silica. That would give us, if we were protecting people at the 12 standard, a level of 1.8. And that's about half the level in California. So the advantage of looking at PM 2.5, we have a standard that's uphold by the EPA and DNR. And given the concentration of silica, we believe that also will protect people against silicosis. Some of the work we've done here, this, these are PM 2.5 samples in Winona prior to the sand construction. So the folks down there invited us to do some background monitoring. The blue plots represent our measurements, and the red are actually background measurements from DNR. So we found that before a, a facility was constructed, they are actually in Winona was pretty clean compared to the regional levels. We've been to a number of times at EOG facility in Chippewa Falls, I think one of the biggest in the state, if not the nation. It's a wet and dry processing plant, and we've been monitoring for the last four years. The first several bars represents during construction, at the beginning of plant operation. The third bar represents uh, no operation, and then the fourth bar represents a recent visit with full operation. So we're seeing increases over time of the measured particulate levels around this sand processing plant. We've been to many, many places, including, as we mentioned, EOG, Superior Silica Sand, 
um, Fairmont Minerals. Uh, we've been to New Auburn and Auburn for superior silica sand. And in each case, we find that our measurements, the green bars, are higher than the background measurements from the DNR. So it's continuing to suggest that if we live, work, uh, play, travel around sand plants, there may be higher levels of these small particulates. Recent work we did with the same instrument to make sure we didn't have bias showed that when we went to a rail line in Eau Claire, actually with no frac sand train traffic, it still was statistically higher than a background sample I took in the woods here. Same thing was for EOG. We had a statistically significant increase using the same instrument. Again, indicating that it appears to be that around frac sand facilities and operations, we have increased levels of these PM2.5 particles. And PM2.5 along the rail line, uh, the big spike is when a loaded frac sand train came through. Uh, other little um, places where the errors are, there was a train maintenance car as well as an, an, a non frac sand train that came through that time. So again, although it was, it, the, the episode ended pretty quickly within several minutes, we did see an increase in the small particulates when the loaded frac sand train came by. We're continuing to do that work. When we looked at PM10, uh, the, the graph on your left, the, the red dot here, represents, I talked about air mod, how the, the DNR predicts the concentrations in the air, that's their prediction. The industry supplied numbers are in blue, so that was actually pretty close. But when we went out there, our tr green triangle showed levels that were several times higher. So, conclusions. The PM2.5 particles with diameters of 2.5 micrometers and less are of most concern to public health. Measurement and enforcement of the current EPA standard of 12 microgram per cubic meter is likely to protect against the risk of particles and silica. Our one to five minutes multiple snapshots found that the measured levels of these small particles increased starting from the Chippewa Falls EOG plant construction through full operation and measured levels of PM2.5 at EOG, Superior Silica, New Auburn and Auburn Fairmount Mine, and High Crush were 1.7 to 22 micrograms per cubic meter higher than the concurrent DNR regional levels. Our initial measurements around train sites uh, suggest that as frac sand trains come by, but not, but not non-frac sand trains, when the frac sand trains come through, there's um, a marked spike in the concentrations of these small particles around the rail line. Next steps, we're continuing to sample. Um, again, my students I know will be with me uh, over the break. <laughs> uh, amazing, we get out there in uh, December and January, we'll be doing a lot of that work. With our stout partners, we'll be doing that work as well. With our University of Iowa partners, we'll be using our new instruments uh, in the cold and in the snow. And it is important not to sample just during the hot, uh, windy months of summer when we expect and see high levels, but year-round, because it's year-round long-term exposure we're most concerned about. We're still awaiting the DNR's response to our request to co-locate our monitors next to theirs to see if, look for any bias. And uh, test and use the shared dust track two and federal reference method dichotomous samplers that are provided by our partners at Stout and in Iowa. And my daughter at Earth Day. <laughs> Good, thank you very much for your attention. You know, it, uh, you might find it a little bit interesting just to know that even though I come from coal country, I know a little bit about silicosis. Um, down the mountain from where I live is a little town called Gawley Bridge, West Virginia. And in the 1930s, it was called, and this is long before the movie was made, the Town of the Living Dead. Because up until the Bhopal disaster, Union, Union Carbide well, uh, the, the largest single industrial disaster in the United States was something called the Hawk's Nest Tunnel Disaster in which the world learned what silicosis is. And thousands of American citizens were killed so Union Carbide could have a tunnel that ran through Gauley Mountain to provide its own hydroelectric power for its own furnaces. And that's essentially the problem. It is that we, we have a way of, come, of saying, look, we found a way to make money. 
and then we wait 10 years and people begin dying in communities. And we say, maybe the way you're making money is the same way these people are dying. But the political system and the monetary system says, but yeah, but we're making money. And that is what, I de and that is what we live in Appalachia. And we've lived it for over a hundred years. And it is, it is what I so fervently yearn for you not to live. And so I say that because, or I say that by way of introduction, I am a founding member of something called the Appalachian Communities Health Emergency Campaign. And it was formed when we began hearing about the research that was being published by Dr. McCauley and some of his colleagues. Um, and we actually managed to get, and, and, and I hope you will take this as inspiration, we have the only bill in the Congress of the United States right now that would ban mountaintop removal and would ban it based upon the threat to human health. It is called H.R. 526. It is the Appalachian Communities Health Emergency Act, the ACHE Act. And we believe that if we can advance this bill, and we understand there are some problems with the Congress right now, <laughs> but if we can advance this bill, then we will be providing a way not just to provide relief inside our own communities, but to help other communities provide relief to theirs. Because I, again, I reiterate, it doesn't matter if it's coal, silica sand, taconite iron ore, as long as they're blasting, to, if they're blasting for ping pong balls, they're still blasting and you're still breathing it. And workers on sites that worry about places like things like silicosis and things like the Mine Safety and Health Administration and NIOSH and OSHA, you know, they worry about workers. But I can tell you in, that in the sacrifice zone in Appalachia where I live, they don't worry about the people who live with it. They do not worry about the people who are downwind of it. They do not worry about the grandmothers lying in hospitals dying from it. They don't worry about it. And this bill is something that we hope will provide a means of beginning to manifest concern for the people, you know, because they don't mine sand. You don't live where they mine sand. I don't live where they mine coal. They mine coal where I live. They mine sand where you live. And you have certain rights that attach as human beings to, 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 to speak up against the things that may be coming your way and that we fear are coming your way. So that is, that is, that is part, of, and, and I offer this all to you by way of saying this is what science can show us. Because all we ever had was the coal industry saying, trust us. And we trusted them all the way into the dirt. And so it is with that that I proudly present to you from West Virginia University School of Public Health, Dr. Michael McCauley. That was a rousing introduction, so hopefully I can live up to it. Um, my name is Mike McCauley, and I wanted to give you a little background, although you've got that, that sheet with some of my biography on it. I wanted to give you a little more background on myself um, about with silica. I was sitting in a conference in 1980 in Houston, Texas, and they got up at the plenary session and they said, Mount St. Helens has erupted. Anybody that knows anything about sampling volcanoes, please let the state of Washington know. Well, I looked at the person sitting next to me and I said, who in their right mind is going to go sampling around an active volcano? The following week when I got there, I found out. 
Um, and the problem, of course, at the time was that the volcanic ash contained silica, and it contained silica in very large amounts, and it contained uh, not only uh, the silicon, the, the quartz type silicon, which, which has a certain toxicity to it, but also contained cristobalite and tritiumite, two other forms, crystalline forms of, of silicon dioxide that are actually much worse, and so people were being exposed to that. That was my initial foray with silica, which led to me doing silica studies throughout all of China, uh, looking at silica exposure and lung cancer. And the current International Agency for Research on Cancer finding that silica causes lung cancer is based on the studies that we did in China. So I have a little bit of experience with silica. Uh, I also helped uh, OSHA write the current silica standard. Uh, and I worked at the time for the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. That is the research group. OSHA does not do research in Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH does, and NIOSH is part of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention out of Atlanta, Georgia. So I worked for them for 27 and a half years and was laughingly called the Silica Czar because uh, I helped coordinate all the silica projects. So I have a little familiarity with silica. That's not necessarily my biggest concern here. Uh, because while I did a lot of mining work and worked on silica, I also worked on diesels. And in fact, I'm proud to say that some of the work I did on diesels just went into another IARC determination that came out this summer that diesel particulate was a carcinogen. So I've gotten around the block a couple of times with these things. And diesels are, produce a particulate matter that's really tiny. And when you see it in the atmosphere, uh, scientists like to group particle sizes into larger groups. The largest, one micrometer and bigger, are called mechanical size or coarse. Um, down around two and a half micrometers, uh, from two and a half to, to perhaps a tenth of a micrometer, it's called fine. Below a tenth of a micrometer, it's called ultrafine. And the ultrafines have been a big issue in the European community, the European Union, where they've been doing a lot of research for a number of years because everybody over there drives a diesel because of the price of gasoline. And because of that, the air in Europe has a lot of these ultrafine particles, and the air in Europe causes a lot of problems because of these ultrafine particles. And that's been well documented in the literature. So I started reading up on this because I thought, well, that might be a problem here, particularly in the mines. And then I started seeing it in the ambient atmosphere. And so when Michael Hendricks, my colleague at West Virginia University, started becoming concerned about mountaintop mining and exposures to mountaintop mining, I thought, no, nah, that's not going to, he's not going to find anything. And he did find something and he found cancers, and he found cardiovascular disease, and he found respiratory disease. And I thought, hmm, that's really strange. I didn't expect to see that. I thought, well, it's probably the water. But I said, you want me to monitor the air? Because a couple of the, the, that set of diseases that you're talking about, I've seen in the literature all associated, associated with ultrafine particles. I don't think we're going to find them, but I'll go out and sample. And so I went out and sampled. Turns out, you'll see this in the slides, but I'm going to give away the ending. Turns out that the one thing that distinguished the area where the mountaintop mining was taking place and where all the diseases were so prevalent from other areas where there wasn't the mountaintop mining and the, disease, the diseases were much less prevalent, the thing that distinguished those two areas were the ultrafine particle concentrations. They were statistically significantly different. 
That means the statisticians will tell you, yeah, there's a difference there. I like to kid my epidemiologist friends. If you've never heard of an epidemiologist, that's a person who studies diseases in populations. And it comes from the same word as epidemic. And I said, you know what an epidemic is? It's something that's so bad, even an epidemiologist knows it's happening. Um, and, and so it has to be significantly different. It, it has to have enough power to it that a statistician will agree that, yeah, the numbers here are very different, and they pass the statistical tests. So that's what I'm going to talk about. I, I've just given you my whole talk. So you can, if, if you're bored by details, you can go to sleep now. My students usually do. Uh, but let me run down the list. You know, I told you how we had this list of, of diseases that we were looking at. Well, here's some papers, most of these from Europe. Um, uh, Peters et al. Uh, found the second bullet down uh, that there's a decrement in peak flow. Now, that's a measure of lung function in asthmatic patients. So people with asthma seem to be affected by this. Uh, rats were affected by it in animal experiments. Um, in fact, uh, we, uh, they were exposed to titanium dioxide. Now, you know how toxic silica is. You just heard about it, right? You know how toxic titanium dioxide is? It's not toxic at all in large particle sizes. But when they started exposing the rats to particle sizes less than a tenth of a micrometer, suddenly they were killing rats with something that was completely non-toxic, they thought. So um, the, the real interesting tidbit is that, that very last dot down there, as little as 8,000 particles per cc was associated with an increase in pediatric asthma admissions to emergency rooms. So keep that 8,000 in mind. That's, that's a level that they found really plays havoc with children with asthma. So it must be doing something. What we think it is, is inflammation. You know, if you, if you scratch your hand, you'll see redness around it. That's inflammation. It can be a little bit of swelling, a little bit of redness, a response from the body. And inflammatory responses, we've known for a while, are associated with things like asthma, but they're also associated with cardiovascular disease. We think that inflammation uh, in the cardio system is associated with buildup of, of material and the blockages that cause heart attacks. And you saw the size on the, uh, up before on the screen. Well, just to put it in a, another slightly different perspective, human hair is about 100 micrometers in size. So the particles that we were talking about before are about the size of a bacteria. That's the PM1, PM2.5. These are around the size of a bacteria. We're talking about particle sizes that are a tenth of that to a hundredth of that. These are actually things that are only a few molecules big. They are smaller than the membranes, the pores in the membranes in your cells. Your cells are not a sol solid shell around them. There are little tiny pores that things can get in and get out of. Well, the pores generally block everything out that's big, but these are smaller than that, and so they can pass into the cells, and we think that may be part of the inflammatory response. Also, when we talk about these little tiny particles, we talk about the number of particles rather than the mass of the particles. So if we had a situation where we had all these raisins in one pumpkin, and we talked about the mass distribution on this table, what the average, what size fruit occurred for the average mass, well, that pumpkin outweighs all of those raisins by a substantial margin. And so the average size of those fruits would be the size of the pumpkin. But on a count basis, we have to look at the relative numbers and see what size accounts for most of the 
numbers of fruits. Well, the most of the numbers is obviously in the raisins. So the average size would be based on the size of that raisin. And we call that a count distribution, an account median diameter, and a mass median diameter. And so when people have talked about silica in the past and talked about PM2.5 and PM10, and the standards that are associated with them, they talk about the mass of material that are in the air. For these tiny particles, the size of them is so small that the appropriate way of talking about the average of what's there is to talk about the number of particles. Because we also believe that the toxic effect is based upon the number of particles that someone's exposed to, not the mass of that particle because the total mass of these little tiny particles is really inconsequential. But the numbers are not. They outnumber the big particles multiple orders of magnitude to one. And these deposit in the lung. Now this is the other concept that's a little difficult to grasp, and it's kind of a paradigm shift but it's the only thing that actually makes sense. Okay, now if you were gonna take an aspirin and your doctor says the dose of this aspirin is two aspirin, right? What do you do? You swallow it, right? And that's your dose of aspirin. Now suppose you give it to a kid, you put it in his mouth and he spits it back out. Did he get his two aspirin? Did he get his dose? No, of course not. Obvious, right? Wrong. It's not obvious. Apparently not obvious to the EPA. Because when they measure PM10 and PM2.5, they don't measure what stays in your body. They measure what goes in your body, most of which comes back out again. They're not measuring dose with PM10 and PM2.5. The simple way of looking at it is, if you took the two aspirin, that was a dose. If you spit them out, it wasn't. You want to measure what stayed. For that, you have to measure what deposits in the lung. And what deposits in the lung is a function of size. And that PM10 and PM2.5, that's a really vague attempt at coming up with a, a size relationship for what will stay in the lung. It's a, a relationship that people thought of in 1958 and was proven wrong by about 1970. The EPA didn't change it. The EPA has never changed it in all of this time. The EPA has been doing this wrong. The EPA has been lying to you. What, you may ask, my government not tell me the truth? <laughs> I'm shocked, quite frankly. But I've decided I'm not gonna let it go on any longer because I was part of the lie. I was on uh, several scientific committees that adopted size selective standards. And the size selective standards went along with the EPA and I feel bad. So I'm making up for that now by telling you that's not what you need. There are a couple of different deposition mechanisms for particles being retained by the lung. One's called impaction, when a particle goes in and hits something. The another's called sedimentation, when the particle just kind of settles out to a surface. And the other is called diffusion, and that's that Brownian motion of really tiny particles. And so when we talk about these ultrafine particles, we have to talk about diffusional deposition in the lung. So you can get that diffusional deposition. And we also have to talk about where in the lung this occurs. Emphysema and the pneumoconioses are really the only major diseases that affect the alveoli. All of the rest of the diseases affect the bronchi and are due to deposition in the bronchi. And so when they talk about PM10, that's sort of a way of getting at what deposits 
in the bronchi, but not really. When they talk about PM2.5, you'd think it was what deposits in the alveoli, but it isn't really. You may have seen a PM4. PM4 is a little closer, but still not really. Okay, according to the EPA, the yellow line and the purple line are exactly alike. <laughs> How many here believe that? <laughs> I got this because if I can get a hand raised, I got this bridge in Brooklyn that I'm going to sell real cheap. Yeah, they're not the same. The yellow line is deposition in your lungs. The purple line, you heard PM10, that's the PM10 standard. The PM2.5 looks like that, only just shift it to the left slightly. So for mountaintop mining, when we studied this, we studied it in a couple of different areas. One where there was an exposed population. The little tiny, teeny weeny pink and blue dots are where there's actually mountaintop mining going on in the state. The big red circle is where we did the sampling, and the big yellow circle is where we did the sampling, and the yellow circle is the control population where there's not mountaintop mining, as you can see from the, the absence of the little tiny dots. And the, the red circle is where there are a lot of little tiny dots. And the red circle is where we had a lot of disease, and the gold circle is where we had much less. Now, the people of West Virginia are, in fact, not very healthy people. Uh, the, there are counties in West Virginia that rank, actually, literally, on the very bottom of the health index scale for the entire United States. We're not proud of that, but it's the truth. So if we look at the age-adjusted mortality per 100,000, the larger the number and the more people are dying, for the mountaintop mining communities, it's the red line. For the rest of Appalachia, it may be a little hard to tell that the middle line is kind of gold-colored. And for non-Appalachia, it's that yellow line on the bottom. So you can see the mountaintop mining areas are different even than the rest of West Virginia on average. And the same thing is true um, for lung cancer deaths. The mountaintop mining areas are much worse and their rates for lung cancer deaths and also for non-lung cancer deaths from other sources. And um, this was the work of uh, Michael Hendricks and one of our grad assistants, Laura Esch. So we controlled for all of those things that should account for the difference, and it didn't. Things like the age of the person, the gender of the person, their race, whether they smoked, whether they lived in poverty, whether they were obese, whether they lived in a rural or an urban setting, whether they had available physician support in their area. Taking all of that into account, there was still a major significant difference between those areas. And again, just some more information that you've seen before on ultrafine particles. There is information out there. It's growing, in fact, that ultrafines can do a lot of the things that we see going on in those southern areas in West Virginia. We have different kinds of sampling equipment in part than what you would have seen Professor Pierce using because we are doing particle counting and we are looking at a different particle size. And so the equipment that we used is, is there on the right. That's, and those are expensive pieces of equipment. Actually, the company that makes them is located in just outside Minneapolis. Um, and they're based upon a lot of research that was done at the University of Minnesota in the School of Mechanical Engineering. That's where the real big particle sizing experts are. Um, and they have now taken that big set of boxes and put it into one small one. I think I had something to do with that because I hauled these all over the place 
having rolled them around in the car a couple of times, and that's, that's almost a quarter million dollars worth of air sampling equipment that probably shouldn't be rolled around in the car. Just, they get so picky. <laughs> um, so here's what they call the odds ratio. This is, is there a difference? There's no difference, it'll be one or less. And the range ran from 1.1 to 1.88. So it's different. It doesn't include one. So there's a significant difference there for cardiovascular. And for respiratory, 1.71. This is what those um, uh, devices that you saw in the back of the car put out. This is a size distribution of the particles. And this is in nanometers. Now a nanometer is one one thousandth of a micrometer. So 100 nanometers is a tenth of a micrometer. So that hundred scale where the peak is occurring is about a tenth of a micrometer. But there's another peak down around uh, 20 or 30 nanometers, which is 0.02 to 0.03 micrometers. Pretty tiny stuff. And when we looked at it, the largest significant difference was between the high disease rate areas and the low disease rate areas. So we're looking at concentrations of anywhere from 2,000 uh, to 6,000 in the low disease rate areas and from 4,000 to about 10,000 in the high disease rate areas. And remember how I said at about 8,000 you should be seeing children showing up in the emergency room with problems with their asthma. So we're in that range. Uh, one of my doctoral students currently is working with nanoparticles. That's the man-made stuff. You remember hearing a lot about nanotechnology? Have you heard much about nanotechnology recently? No. You know why? When they started looking at nanotoxicology, they found that the nanotechnology was so toxic that nobody wanted to make it. So they don't. And until they can find a non-toxic particle, toxicologist friend of mine and I have a, a standing bet that the first one of us that can find a non-toxic nano-sized particle gets the five bucks. That five bucks is as safe as, it, as if it was in a bank vault so far. <laughs> and we're seeing crustal kinds of elements when we look at the particulate. That means it's coming from the overburden, from stuff that's being blown off the side of the mountain. That's what you and I would in our technical parlance call dirt. Yes, dirt can be toxic. It doesn't have to be something weird and strange and um, never heard of before. It can just be as common as dirt. And it looks like that's what's causing the toxicity. And yeah, SI, who here knows what that stands for silicon, right? That's one of the major constituents that we've got in our dirt because it's a major constituent in dirt. And when they took some of that dirt and they gave it to rats, guess what? They gave them hypertension. And if you're like me, you don't need any more hypertension in your your life. <laughs> I got a boss who'll do that for me. <laughs> and a wife. <laughs> and, and I don't want hypertension from the air I'm breathing. And you can't see these particles. You couldn't see the particles before. Well, these particles are perhaps a thousand times smaller, and you really can't see them. <laughs> so if 
Uh, in fact, they're highest, it appears, on really clear days. If it's hazy outside, you probably haven't got a lot. They've already got condensate around them and are falling out of the air and they're already bigger. But on really clear days, that's when the concentrations seem to be the highest. So you walk outside and you go, well, there's not much pollution out here today. Apparently that's wrong too. So I've learned a lot from doing this project. And I've been wrong a lot of the times in thinking, well, we're not going to find anything here. Okay, we found something wrong there, but we're not going to find anything wrong here. Now we found something wrong there too. I went in with a scientist healthy skepticism, in fact, maybe a little more healthy skepticism than I should have had. I should have probably trusted Professor Hendricks more uh, going in than I perhaps did. And I'm kind of a believer now that there's something going on in these areas and that it's related to these ultrafine particles and that the EPA is doing nothing about it. They don't want to hear about ultrafines because they have a system of sampling out there that cost millions, if not billions of dollars throughout the United States, and none of it will sample the ultrafines. They'd have to change all of that around. They'd also have to redo a lot of their case law because it looks like maybe even some of the larger stuff may not have the toxicity they thought it had. That when you saw Professor Pierce talk about, here are what these studies showed, well, what those studies were showing that the EPA thought was related to the PM 2.5, in fact, may not have been related to PM 2.5 at all. And the Europeans sure don't think so. And the Europeans are adopting standards that, in fact, do measure dose. Are they smarter than we are? Or does somebody just not want to change? I'm hoping that there's going to be a change. And I'm hoping, I'm not trying to make villains, by the way, out of anybody who creates dusts as part of their operations. I spend a lot of my time doing mining work. I have even, truth be told, I have even worked for people who make silica sand on occasion. Okay, so I've been on both sides of the fence. But I think what we need to do is monitor the right things and let the people control on the basis of good knowledge, not half knowledge. Because when we're doing this, we're trying to, some people are hoping it will get done fast, and other people are trying to do it half fast. <laughs> so hopefully we'll get answers fast on this. And if uh, you need to contact me, that's my information. Thank you. So did we get the cards passed around? Awesome. Um, would someone like to collect them, please? Tell you, yeah, why don't I do that? Thank you. Okay. So, we, so while the rest are being collected, we've got a little something to work with. Oh, what lovely, what lovely handwriting. It's a lost art. Uh, that's a one and a two. Okay. All right, here's a, here's, a, here's a quick one, Dr. McCauley. Just wondering, how do you measure the blood pressure of mice? A little tiny cuff. Let me try this. 
Yeah, actually, it's with little tiny pressure devices. Uh, most of the time we work in rats, though, because you're right. It's really hard to do it in mice when you're doing a lot of this stuff. And actually, the way we do it in the mice, in the rats, uh, requires opening the rats up, unfortunately, uh, anesthetizing them, opening them up, and then sacrificing them at the end of the experiment. I'm not a big fan of killing off animals for, for experimentation, but sometimes it has to be done, and I think this is one of those times, unfortunately. Okay, um, Dr. Pierce. Uh, how do you determine the percentage of PM10? I, I, so I understand it's for. How do, you, how do you determine the percentage of PM10 that is PM2.5? Well, the way we've done this work is we simultaneously measure both PM2.5 and PM10. What we're finding is about 65, 70% of the, the PM10 is actually PM2.5 around frac sand plants. So it's important to know the, the size distribution as well as the silica component. And the way to do that is to measure everything at the same time and do the analysis on the same samples. And another one, Dr. Pierce. Why is PM10 the only particulate size that is monitored today according to regulations? Uh, the DNR's position is that the PM2.5, the larger particles, are more associated, more easily blown off of sand piles. And I believe there is certainly truth to that. But again, uh, the PM2.5, and certainly we have some disagreement here on the stage, but I think we all agree that it's the smallest particles that get into the deep lung which are of most concern. So um, my point of view is we want to protect public health and communities. And maybe the, uh, we're seeing that sand plants are contributing 2.5, but there are other sources as well. Combustion we talked about with diesel traffic, uh, Condensation, as was mentioned earlier, there may be other industrial sources. I think we should be measuring PM2.5 wherever we have a sand plant that includes, frankly, the background, because I want to protect public health, whether it's 70% from the sand plant or 15% from the sand plant. Let's look at the ambient levels to protect uh, people in the area. Um, I've got one here. It just says, Bob, who is Christopher Klein? Oh, dear. Are the libel laws in effect? Um, Chris Klein is a rogue hillbilly. Um, by that I mean he is a billionaire coal operator from West Virginia <laughs> whose companies tend to generate more violations than they do coal. Um, he is the driving force, therefore, then behind Gogebic Taconite, which is the outfit that has decided that since they've made a wreck of coal-bearing states like West Virginia and Southern Illinois, they'd like to go ahead and wreck uh, the iron ore-bearing area of Northern Wisconsin. That is who Chris Klein is. Chris Klein is a guy who owns a yacht called Mine Games, you know, because these things that are actually our lives are his games. That's who Chris Klein is. Um, Okay, uh, uh, you both got microphones. Take it as, as you wish. Why do people keep saying we have no evidence connecting industrial sand mining to silicosis or there's no proof of negative health impacts? Well, we do have decades of research saying that people who work in silica-related industries, uh, glass production, sand blasting, flooring, have increased rates of silicosis and lung cancer. But the, the frac sand mine business in Wisconsin and down in Minnesota is fairly new and enlarging. So we don't have the kinds of decades of research that have clearly associated this. I think the, the best analogy for me is uh, um, people who smoke versus secondhand smoke. We have good evidence that people who smoke develop lung cancer, but it took decades to, to realize that secondhand smoke also causes those effects. So again, um, my crusade, my message is that we need to require monitoring. And if the levels are above safe levels the EPA has established, and I do believe there is value in those standards, that's time to do something about lowering the emissions. Yeah, you have to be careful with, with science um, or people doing this kind of science that says, well, if we haven't tested it in this exact individual, we don't know what's happening. I have a gun, I've got a bullet in it, but I've never shot her. So I'm going to try it and see if it'll hurt. Who knows? It might not. Uh, that's not good science. Uh, we can tell 
from all of the literature for the past 70 or 80 years now, how much silica it takes to cause silicosis, how much silica it takes uh, to increase your risk for lung cancer. Those things are known. You don't have to prove them again. Once you've proven them in science, they're proven. A uh, question here about uh, mountaintop removal, uh, Dr. McCauley. There's a clear correlation geographically between disease outcomes and MTR sites. What's the causal mechanism? Oh, this is good. What's the causal mechanism for ultrafine particle formation? Ah, yeah. Here's my lecture one in aerosol science class. The coarse particles are generated by mechanical action. So we sometimes call them mechanical size particles. So mechanical action would be crushing, grinding, those kinds of things. The smallest of particles are called condensation nuclei particles. And size in between are called agglomeration size. Agglomeration means clumping together. So you know that the agglomeration size are stuff that's clumped together, and it's clumped together from the smallest size. Now, what causes the smallest size? Usually it takes a lot of energy to break something up that small or to put it in a vapor state and let it condense down. And so things like explosions, combustion, those kinds of high energy sources are the things that create ultrafine particles. How does all the scientific research and evidence weigh in compared to money in huge amounts and the politicians who are more than happy to take it? Um, may I suggest that that is not a science question, gentlemen? It's all yours. Uh, if, if I may just speak to that. Please do. It is not a science question, but my uh, perspective on this is we need to include all the costs, oftentimes called external externalities or external costs. What are the costs of using a particular source of energy? What are the costs of mining and using this, this sand for hydraulic fracturing? All of the costs can and should be included when we make decisions about how we're going to uh, derive energy. Maybe, maybe in talking about that, Dr. Pierce, uh, let's say gasoline is $3.50 a gallon. If we include the externalized cost of the production of that gasoline, how much is the gasoline per gallon then? Yes, that, that's the question we need to be asking. There's a, a power report out recently that talked about the true costs of mining in Wisconsin. It, it casts some shadows on the number of jobs that are created and actual economic benefit. But ultimately, I do believe we can compare apples to apples when we talk about all the costs. And just to give you an example of that, uh, Dr. Hendricks, uh, whom Dr. McCauley referenced, did some early work talking because we, we can't go to the mailbox, we can't, uh, we, we can't wash the car, we can't, without hearing somebody say, coal keeps the bats on. And, uh, and, and how, you know, the, the coal industry is why there's an Appalachia. It is, is, it is as if on whatever day of creation that the coal beds were laid down, the Almighty created the coal industry to mine it. Um, so what Dr. Hendricks found out was that for roughly, and, and you know, for something that's supposed to be an economic engine running a state, it came as, it came as rather of a surprise. I mean, it's, this, is, this is, you know, if you, that same guy you're going to sell the bridge to, you know, he's going to get into this business because it turns out for every dollar that coal brings to West Virginia, the state of West Virginia pays out five in externalized costs, healthcare costs, excess deaths, disease, environmental degradation, all of that. And so it's the, it's the kind of thing that you've absolutely got to find out now. And, and, and the frustrating thing politically is that they've already, you know, they did it to you. They started the sand mining before you knew what the externalized costs were going to be. And see, that's the biggest carnival, midway, sideshow con that there is. And it is, and, and, and what they have started on you, they're getting ready to roll into the Pinocchies. Okay? 
And, the, and, the, and, the, and in, in, both, in every case, whether it be coal in Appalachia or sand, uh, frac sand here or, or, or taconite in the Pinocchies, it's always the same, it's the same shtick. It's, we're going to bring you some jobs. <laughs> and we're going to have us some prosperity. And we're going to have economic growth. And there's going to be hundreds of jobs paying tens of thousand dollars a year and frisbees and wheat checks and heaven on earth. <laughs> well, you know what? I can tell you about a little place called Mingo County, West Virginia, or Boone County, West Virginia, where more coal has been moved over a hundred years than I could probably even calculate or express the calculation of. It's one of those counties that Dr. McCauley mentioned that is one of the absolute sickest counties in the United States. You see, there are two congressional districts in this country. One is represented by my congressman, Nick Joe Rahal. The other is represented by a Republican named Hal Rogers in Kentucky. And they take turns being the single sickest congressional districts in the entire United States. They take turns. One year it'll be us, next year it'll be them. But you know what they've both got in common? Massive, massive extractive industry that's supposed to bring all of this prosperity. And it hasn't happened for a hundred years. Uh, let's see. I think we answered that one. Um, Dr. Pierce, you may, you may have a, um, a, a better handle on this. Are the area sand mines anywhere near compliant? And I guess the question is compliant with what? And if the standards aren't valid, or if the standards aren't what they need to be, what does compliance mean? When a sand mine is, is proposed, as I mentioned before, it's really based on a model. How much sand can be processed and the different procedures that can be used to heat or size or um, uh, co convey those small particles. And so it's really an exercise on paper. Now indeed, there needs to be annual stack testing by the sand proponents to see what's actually in the stacks that are going out. But beyond that, DNR generally only responds where there is a complaint. The citizen will say, it looks very, very dusty. I'm seeing a lot of dust out of the sand mine or this transportation facility. In that case, and I think I showed you at the Patterson mine, DNR does come out in those circumstances. But most of the work, the monitoring is done by the sand mine itself and their consultants. So they will hire a consultant to measure the PM10, which as I've tried to convey tonight, is, is not the most important size. So it's really uh, sand mine showing compliance by hiring their own consulting company to do these measurements. And in terms of the actual regulations, uh, the actual dose can be off by anywhere from a factor of two to a factor of six. So anywhere from twice to sixfold what is being measured. So at that point in, t in, in either instance, in, in, in a way you're saying that there's really no data on compliance. We really don't have a lot of information and what's also happened in Wisconsin, as many of us know, with more than 120 facilities planned or in operation, uh, we're having we're getting more and more public exposure. The sand mine industry is exploding. Um, and it's, it's very, very important as we have more and more exposure to more and more people to do better and better monitoring because we're getting great level exposure. We don't have, it's not the sand mining of 15 years ago. We have these small mom and pop gravel quarries. We're talking about sizes, 10, 15, 20 football field size EOG plants with more people exposed. It doesn't necessarily mean there's a big danger, but we are having more exposure and more of uh, people living near these facilities. And so again, monitoring is what we need to do. And, and by the way, uh, let, me just, let me just tell you that uh, I've been up here several times now, and I'm thrilled to be in Eau Claire. Never been here before. Um, and, and I just I love the entire state of Wisconsin. And I think the saddest moment I've ever had in the state of Wisconsin came this evening when I walked into this room. And at a distance, I looked at those photographs, and I said, I didn't bring any pictures of mountaintop removal. <laughs> I hate to say it as much as I love this place. It looks like home. Um, and by the way, y'all are putting in some awesome questions. 
Are you aware of any studies on the chemical composition of, P of particulate matter emitted by anphoblasting? Species of chemicals bound to blasting, soot, levels of NOx, COHC from anpho. Um, what we've seen when we've done this is we've seen lots of hydrocarbons of various sorts. So if you take something that's made of a carbonaceous compound and you combust it, whether by exploding it or just lighting it on fire, you get this broad spectrum of compounds, uh, many of which are volatile organic compounds. Um, and not only in particulate matter, but in gaseous matter. Um, I've just completed a study of fracking uh, for natural gas operations and saw a lot of diesel trucks. We were seeing a lot of benzene in those operations, which, by the way, is another carcinogen. Um, so that's, those are the gases, and we, we saw lots of, lots of those kinds of things. And, of course, it's worth remembering that the explosives that are used, whether it be, well, in any sort of massive extractive industry, that's diesel fuel and ammonium nitrate, or ammonium nitrate for the most part. Um, and so you're going to get those hydrocarbons, right? Exactly. I mean, exactly. As a, uh, by definition. Correct. Um, some of you may remember last April that, that poor little town in Texas, uh, West Texas, that blew up. That was a giant accidental ammonium nitrate explosion. So basically, they got accidentally what's being done to y'all intentionally. Okay? Um, does EPA regard silica sand as cancerous? One. I mean, you talked about the fact that it is designated, but does EPA? EPA has not set a standard for public exposure to silica, and they have not designated, to my knowledge, um, crystalline silica as a uh, human carcinogen. I did mention that OSHA, MSHA, NIOSH uh, have all made that designation, as well as IARC, as we talked about, part of your work designating that. But EPA itself has not established a standard for the public. Okay, the three mic per cubic meter is an indoor standard. How about outdoor? It's actually an outdoor standard that's established by all the states. I mentioned the six states, so it's an ambient standard designed to protect people 24-7 if we live in a location. And it's interpreted, as we mentioned earlier, from decades of research on miners and people working with sandblasting who have higher concentrations, so it's adjusted. So it indeed represents a, um, a long-term exposure standard that is expected to protect people against silicosis. Uh, three. DNR points to EPA not listing silica sand as a hazardous substance. Is that, is that a sufficient ground for them to take that position? Well, I hope as, as my colleague and I have talked about today, we're talking about some very serious small particle inhalation. Um, we also have characteristics of crystalline silica because of its shape and reactivity, particularly freshly fractured silica in the sand mines tends to be two to five times more toxic in animal studies. So um, as a scientist, I try to look at all of the data, and the data are indicating, again, from decades of research, that these silica causes silicosis, tuberculosis, kidney disease, as well as lung cancer. Uh, in email exchanges I've had with the DNR, they recognize that crystalline silica is a human carcinogen. So I, I find the designation of just EPA not listing it as a little bit questionable when so many other agencies and so many decades of research have found it to be carcinogenic. But is it listed in the Code of State Rules or CSR or whatever? It is not. It is not. So legislative, it is, legislatively, it isn't? That's correct. Okay. Um, and and a, a, a lot of good questions here, but what local conditions constitute good conditions for taking sample readings, or do multiple conditions uh, and different parameters have to happen in order to have a good, uh, a good swath of studied data, or good data set? I would just reiterate that we're looking at long-term exposure. I don't expect anybody's going to get acute silicosis from living near sand mine, but I do expect there may be some elevation in cardiovascular and lung function risk when we're taking a long-term look. That's why chronic or long-term permanent monitors are really needed at these facilities to see if we're getting above levels that are known to cause long-term disease. 
Okay, somebody in this room is an activist. Um, monitoring is an early step in the process. How long does monitoring have to be done before proactive action can be started and taken? The DNR requires, based upon the EPA standards, three years of measurement of PM 2.5. That's the EPA standard. It concerns me quite a bit because, again, our snapshot sample is finding levels above that standard. Uh, it, it's difficult, and um, uh, you may sh share my concerns here, but we begin to see the beginnings of what looks like dangerous particulates. It's, it's difficult to say, let's wait three years for the data to come in. So that's why I guess uh, the people in this room were all pretty important in talking to our legislators and asking questions and talking to our health departments that some initial data suggests that there's a concern. Do we really need to wait three years before mandatory requiring monitoring of all facilities? And, and my suggestion is no. We should be monitoring them now. Um, I think there's no reason why um, anybody shouldn't recognize silica as a carcinogen. There's, there's just there's no good technical reason. Um, there may be a political reason. But if it's a political reason, then you better be talking to your politicians. And in point, in point of fact, um, if you really want to good, get a good snapshot, you know, just as you had an, you know, a clean area and just as in your, your data you had a place that had no mountaintop removal going on in it, if you, want to know, if you want to know what the particulate dust count is in a given community, actually you want to start, sam start monitoring and sampling before they ever set off the first blast, isn't that correct? So that you've got some sort of a, uh, some sort of um, baseline that's mm -hmm. yes. valid. Yes. Um, okay, more a comment than a question. A local assembly, but you know, feel free to scoff or whatever you feel uh, like doing. A local assemblyman says no one has died of silica dust in the community. You guys have an assemblyman from Mars? Okay, somebody had to say something snarky there. Um, that's my job. Dr. McCauley, what about dust coming off the farm fields? Well, yes, there, there's a background in the ultrafines. Um, and in fact, if you noticed, in the area where there was no mountain uh, <clears throat> top mining, there was still ultrafine particles. So yeah, there, there is a background, and dust coming off of farm fields would be part of that background. Uh, the problem is when you start getting well above that background, what's going to happen? Um, or even slightly below it, but the background that you'd be talking about is below that 8,000 particles per cc limit. It's probably, should be on the order of 2,000, 3,000 particles per cc, which is what we were finding, although actually we found levels that were in the hundreds of particles. So, yeah, there, it, that's, that's part of it, but the background is the background and you want to know what happens around that that it's also important to have an upwind and a downwind sampler when you do these kinds of things and and when we go out and do our sampling we'll usually try to do upwind and downwind or close in and far away uh, to to account for that uh, but it, it's a good question to ask technically and then you know, if please, I could just add sure. to that uh, in our research, the farm tilling of silica are larger particle sizes, less apt to get deep into the lung, and again, not freshly fractured, they're called weathered, so they're less uh, reactive, they have fewer reactive oxygen species in the farm fields compared to freshly fractured silica that may have been blasted or crushed or transported. Yeah, I, I was just appointed to a panel at NASA looking at lunar dust and the toxicity of it because a lot of the lunar dust looks like freshly fractured silica. And NASA's particularly worried about the properties of lunar dust uh, and what it may do. So, in fact, it, it runs with the, the same concerns that a lot of other scientists have about silica. And then secondarily, um, Dr. McCauley, would you say um, your positions regarding ultrafines and counting them as a count as opposed to mass is gaining more traction in the United States? Well, I'm doing my part. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, there are some more uh, there are some more articles in the journal starting to be seen, but it really the traction is coming from Europe, where they're starting to pass laws about it. 
Uh, if you want to see me talking more about it, actually I'll be, you can search on the internet. Uh, after November 20th, the German National Broadcast Company is broadcasting an interview uh, that I did to talk about that, in which the Europeans kind of understand this intrinsically. Uh, and, and so I mean, it's just, it's time for us to really uh, make people sit up and listen. Uh, here's an interesting one. They all are. Are there any studies being considered or being done on the mental health of people living in mining areas, depression, anxiety, stress, etc., which can lead to many other health-related issues? Dr. Hendricks has been doing, actually, Dr. Hendricks is a psychologist by training. Uh, so he's been looking at some of these issues and continues to do research in this area. He's no longer at West Virginia University. His, his wife actually moved to Indiana. He moved with her. She's, also, she's an epidemiologist. And so uh, he's continuing to do a lot of this work. Uh, and by, by the way, uh, with, with all these things, you know, as, as a hillbilly, I freely acknowledge that we have a lot of bad habits. We like, we like, we like a side of gravy with our side of gravy, okay? Um, and yes, we smoke and we make bad health choices, but all, the, all these things have all of that factored into it. Now, just to give you an idea of the way that the mining industry responds to that uh, and, and the fact that, you know, these studies are done and all these things are factored in, diet, smoking, education, poverty, access to medical care, that kind of thing. When the, when the report came out that said that there are significantly more birth defects in mountaintop removal communities than uh, in non-mountaintop removal communities, the National Mining Association, of whom I don't know, maybe some companies around here might be a member, responded to the report by saying that the scientists' work in that report was not valid. And they said that the report was not valid because the scientists failed to take into account that hillbillies commit incest with each other. <laughs> not kidding. Now, they, they, they put it a little more nicely. They said consanguinity. It didn't take into account consanguinity. Poor fools couldn't even spell consanguine, and I'm a hillbilly, and I know how. But that's, that's what you get from them. Um, let's see. Uh, going back here, I want to get as many of these in as I can. Um, okay. This, is, this may be the $64 question for you both for tonight. To both presenters, I need to explain about this subject to regular people. <laughs> but, and the, and the but takes up about half the card. <laughs> I didn't understand what you said. <laughs> Would you please simplify? We'll be here all week. Try the veal. No. All right, I'll start first. What I said was, there are little tiny pieces of stuff in the atmosphere that are much smaller than what the EPA usually considers. They seem to be causing a lot of damage to bodies. If you want to tell people something simple, that's what it is. You should be monitoring for those because the EPA doesn't monitor for them. And they can. I mean, it, it is physically possible oh, yeah. for somebody besides the EPA to monitor for this stuff. Oh, yes. The folks at TSI in Minneapolis will be glad to sell you all sorts of equipment to do that. <laughs> they didn't pay me to say that, but, but that's who, yeah. So get them from your local boys. They're, 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 it's a, I think a run at it, Dr. Pierce. I'd just like to add that, indeed, we know that these kinds of activities, mining, Processing, transporting the small particles generate more of those little tiny things that get into our deep lungs. And so we need to be measuring those little things to see if we're at levels that are going to cause death and disease. Um, here's a, this is a beautiful real world question. When, and they do this, really? When school kids take a field trip to a local sand operation, 
They are asked to wear hard hats while they are there. I can't go on. Should they also be asked to wear masks on these tours? kind of ambient levels uh, that we're talking about people who need to be exposed to, again, are long, potential long-term risks. We're not talking about levels generally that would cause acute problems with lung breathing. Actually, many of the students here in our geology department, for example, are learning about frac sand mines. I think it's an important educational experience, but we're talking about uh, levels that will not cause immediate harm. So it's the long-term exposure we're most concerned about monitoring and protecting against. I'm completely in agreement with that. Absolutely. So it's it's okay. It's okay. No mask. The mask wouldn't do that much to start with. So. Well, that was my next question. Is yeah. there a mask that'll stop this stuff? Yeah, there is. Yeah, there is. But you have to. There are all sorts of procedures you'd have to go through to to do it properly, and it's 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 probably not worth the effort for the short exposure. Okay, because following that question, I've got a separate question that kind of feels like it plays along the same lines. Please review the 8,000 level for asthma in children. Uh, you know, if we, for instance, um, you, you buy a bag of snacks and it says, we now have a warning on it that says this stuff was produced in a facility that processes peanuts because we don't want a little child with a peanut allergy to have a go into anaphylaxis because you know they didn't know so one of these child a kid an asthmatic kid i mean should i mean should there be some sort of notification uh, cuz i'm sorry i come from somewhere that you know they're not going to take children on a mountaintop removal site or anything that, that just kind of blew my mind i apologize but could you the, elaborate yeah, me, on that 8000 level explain about the study and, yeah. uh, it was done in copenhagen Okay, uh, they monitored these little tiny particles for a long period of time. At the same time that they did that, they were keeping records of admissions to the emergency rooms in the city. We, they think, and I would agree, that probably a lot of the little tiny particles were coming from the diesel traffic. And when the diesel traffic levels got high enough, they were seeing people showing up in the emergency room. So in fact, that is a, a short-term acute exposure that was happening there, and we think that the 8,000 is probably an acute exposure. And that's why I also think the EPA should have monitoring facilities for this kind of stuff just to protect children with asthma, because it's, I think it's pretty well established that this stuff can really exacerbate uh, a pre-existing asthma condition in a child. And uh, Dr. Pierce, please elaborate on the findings in the filters of the New Auburn School District. Um, we, we've been up there, we've done some monitoring in the New Auburn School District, we're gonna go there next week. Um, some of the levels were of concerns, we wanna go back and verify them. It's, um, the, the Wisconsin Occupational Health Lab looked at the filters under the microscope and get a rough percentage of the percent that was silica versus pollen versus dander uh, versus dust. Um, the, the conclusion that I've seen, I've, I've seen reports now, is that they have two central filtering systems. The one that pulls in more outside air has higher levels of silica than the one that uses recirculated air. We can't, uh, based upon just detecting seeing silica on the filters, we can't easily back predict the concentration to which children would be exposed. But it does tell us that there is an outside source of silica that's being collected on the filters. Um, another dandy just coming in. Once created, how long will these very small particles be with us? Hmm. Um, the thing that will tend to remove them from the air are the weather patterns. Um, also, the weather patterns can bring them as well from other sources farther away. Uh, we've known that for a long time, that sitting in West Virginia, some of our air pollution is coming from as far away as St. Louis. But you can see these in the air for several weeks as they move with the weather system. Uh, eventually, they will rain out. Uh, eventually, they will form droplets around the, the, these tiny...
particles and those droplets will fall out or be captured by foliage that they come in contact with and other things. Uh, they may be scavenged by uh, wave motion on, on the lakes, all of those kinds of things, but uh, they can persist for periods of time. Uh, if there are inversions and there can be subsidence, what they call subsidence inversions in this part of the country, uh, the air can stagnate and those concentrations can build up over periods of time. Uh, the longest I know of is about a two week period where those built up before the air washed them through. So yes, they can be washed out. If they're constantly being produced, I'm not sure that that's a big help necessarily. But. Dr. Pierce, has there been any research done at the New Auburn School regarding whether or not there's an increase in asthma among the student body? Not that I know of. Uh, I think that's important to do. Uh, I guess I want to talk more broadly about, uh, we talked about the psychological effects. Um, my emphasis on required monitoring, I think, would do a lot to both alleviate people's concerns if we have levels that are safe, uh, to coin a, 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 a colleague's term, responsible monitoring. If we're actually monitoring the level, it may do a lot to alleviate people's concerns. Of course, we all know about the issues of air pollution days and air pollution alerts. Dr. McCauley talked about air inversions. We have that a couple times a winter, often in, in uh, Wisconsin. So it, it, it really is that regular air monitoring that we need to do to be responsible. If the levels are of, of above the PM 2.5 standards, for example, then I believe that a strong partnership between public health and mining industry would be we need to do something about it. So I'm not anti-mining, I am pro-public health. So if I'm doing that monitoring, we can both, if we have safe levels, people can be reassured. If we have dangerous levels, we can identify the source of the problem and ostensibly do something about it. And there are ways we can reduce a fugitive dust generation at mining sites. And I, I just spoke uh, with the West Virginia legislature a couple of weeks ago about fracking operations because the problem was they wanted to have a setback distance from the drilling. And in fact, a setback distance, I told them, would do nothing because not all of the pollution is coming from just the center of the well, which is where they wanted to measure from. And it didn't take into account whether they were sitting down in a narrow valley or whether the, the weather was going to create an inversion that would trap the pollution in one area. And that really, the answer to all of this was monitoring. So we are in 100% agreement that really what needs to be done is monitoring. And in fact, we didn't really get much pushback from uh, the, the people who were doing the drilling. They said, yeah, we, we can do that monitoring and, and we think we can control our operations so that we stay within the right boundaries. I would hope that the mining industry up here would think the same thing and would do the same thing. It's, it just seems like the right thing to do. And uh, uh, we're running out of time, but I'm going to get a couple more questions. And I would like to say something real quick, lest anyone form um, an opinion about at least me, because I, I say what I think. Um, I told you all about the AIC Act, H.R. 526. We've explained to people in Congress that this is not about mining, that this is about human health. I mean, we've gone so far as to look at members of Congress and say, listen, if they were manufacturing tennis balls on top of a blasted mountain and the people living below the mountain were getting sick, we would be worried about the tennis ball manufacturing. It is not specific to any one given industry. It is not specific to any one industrial practitioner. But, there, but I maintain the position that innocent people have a right not to be poisoned for some distant third party's profit. Okay? And that is, that is, in a way, a, a means of expressing something called the precautionary principle. That is, you do not get to do something that affects people on a, on a broad basis without knowing whether or not it is safe to do it in the first place. So I, I just wanted to be clear about that. Uh, a really good question coming in, because we've been talking about human health a lot, and I'm kind of a humanist, so that's where... But this is, you know, there's farm country around here. 
Uh, do we, can, we, can we express anything about the effects of particulate matter or uh, silicas on livestock, farm livestock, uh, cows, horses? And secondly, um, can, is there any danger to be had from eating, say, crystalline silica that has deposited on food grown in farms and so forth? Cheese curds. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, we know there's an effect in animals from the ultrafines because that's how we found out a lot about what the ultrafines do. Uh, whether you can get that same effect in a cow, I'm sure nobody has tried that yet that I've seen. Um, and, and so it, that's an open question. Uh, in terms of eating silica, um, there's, there's no indication in any of the literature that eating silica will be a problem. However, there's always a but. Um, there is an indication that high levels of silica on the skin can cause immunological reactions. We see in sandblasters an excess of rheumatoid arthritis, not from what they inhaled apparently, but from what probably got on their skin. That's still theoretical, but it's a concern. I don't think from just the stuff that you get in the air around here, you'd see those kinds of levels on your skin here. But it's, it's a concern. It's probably more of a concern for the workers around these plants than for the population living around them. Yes, I would like to add, there are a couple of case studies where I actually do see farm animals, horses and cows with silicosis. I don't know that it's a widespread phenomenon, but clearly farm animals, domestic animals can uh, be diagnosed. One of the difficulties in diagnosing silicosis in humans is traditionally we use a chest <coughs> x-ray, but recent studies have found that we don't catch all the cases. It actually takes an autopsy to open up and take a look and look at the deposition of silica in the lungs. So we may actually be underestimating the rates of silica-caused disease because the x-ray technique is not as precise as we'd like to, it to be. Um, and, and I think a lot, well, it's all kind of along the same lines. Uh, but I'm going to wrap up, uh, I think we're going to wrap up with this one, if that's okay, because we're getting right up on time, on top of the time that uh, we have the room for. Um, is the human body able to rid itself of fine silica particles, or I would add other particulate matter, Dr. McCauley, or is the process entirely bioaccumulative? It's not entirely bioaccumulative, but I have seen lungs from miners in which you could wash out sand from lungs of the deceased miners like you were washing out sand from your kids' clothes at the beach. The, this was in a, progressive, a case of what they call progressive massive fibrosis. So the person had gotten quite a dose and the, the lung had basically turned rock hard. Uh, it should have kind of the consistency of normal human tissue like liver you buy at the store, that kind of stuff. This, the, these lungs you could pretty close to hammer nails with. Uh, and that's, that's what progressive massive fibrosis will do to a person. That's not likely going to happen to the communities here. Again, I, that's a concern for workers. But uh, yes, the silica can accumulate. Not all of it will accumulate. There's a clearance mechanism in your lung to push the dust that deposits in your tracheobronchial tree out, not as well as what uh, your, the alveoli where silicosis occurs don't have that uh, same capacity to nearly the extent that the branches of the lung do. And so that's where you'll see a lot of the accumulation. And of course, it's also where you see the disease. And just to add that some of these particles are so small, they actually permeate the blood brain or the blood uh, respiratory interface so they can be transported to places like the kidney. So they're so small that not only do they do damage in the lung, but they can be transported throughout the body, small particle mm -hmm. sizes. And for the mothers or mothers-to-be in the audience, they transit the placental barrier, do they not? I'm sure they do, the ultrafines. Yeah. 
I wish we could have gotten to a lot more. Qu well, we got to a good number of them. Wouldn't you agree? Um, I, at the beginning of the event, Pat uh, told you who all was responsible for putting this together. And I want to add my thanks to her thanks and my thanks to all of you for your kind attention and for caring enough about your communities to come out, hear this information, and take it back and act upon it. I thank you sincerely. Um, I also thank Dr. McCauley and Dr. Pierce for the expertise that they have brought uh, to this evening. Because in point of fact, one of the problems that we have as members of a community is that there is a whole lot of information out there, whether it be the industry or government. There is a whole lot of gate-kept information out there. And if knowledge is power, then what you have just been handed this evening by these two learned gentlemen is a great, great deal of power. So I would ask for an ovation for them. And my thanks. was recorded and presented by Chippewa Valley Community Television. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cvctv.org.